So it's, it's a pleasure to have Mark Shandy uh, um, visiting us today from Zoom. Um, Mark is a senior scientist at NTT Research and assistant professor at Princeton University. He's done a lot of important work on post-quantum crypto and more recently in quantum algorithms and complexity. Um, he's had a recent breakthrough result on provable quantum advantage, but today I think he's going to tell us more about uh, the quantum algorithm side. So, Mark. All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about the basically the core algorithmic technique that we used in our recent quantum advantage work. Um, so let's let's start with the classical world and imagine that I have two distributions. Uh, you know, maybe this uh, comb here and a Gaussian here. Um, and what I want to do is somehow multiply them. And what I mean by that is take the two distributions as input and produce an output distribution where the pointwise probabilities are the product of the pointwise probabilities of the input distribution. Now, uh, the, the pointwise product won't be properly normalized, but what we would want is that the uh, distribution has uh, probability proportional to the product. Um, and what I really mean when I say this is I, we, I want to imagine that we have an efficient algorithm for sampling D1 and an efficient algorithm for sampling D2. And I want to somehow combine these into an efficient algorithm for sampling um, this, this product distribution that I've defined. Uh, now, in general, there's no reason to think that this is possible. And in fact, it, it, it will be, you know, sort of nonsense in general. Um, so, you know, to think about, like, how do we make use of both samplers? Each sampler, we just run and we get a, a sample from some distribution. How do we possibly use that to generate a single sample from a different distribution? Um, it's not clear. Um, and to make matters worse, the um, the product distribution is actually just uh, not defined for some in some cases. For example, if D1 and D2 have disjoint supports, the product distribution doesn't make sense. Uh, the the pointwise products are zero everywhere. There's no distribution. Um, so so clearly something is going to go wrong in, in full generality. Um, and even if we sort of ignore that issue with the existence of the product distribution and just say, okay, maybe we only care about distributions that have um, overlapping support. Uh, well, we still wouldn't expect this to be done do doable efficiently because in full generality, it would imply an efficient algorithm for NP. Um, this isn't hard to see. Okay, uh, so this seems like we're, we're not gonna be able to do this. Uh, so, so in this work, what we, what we looked at is something that looks very similar um, except that instead of multiplying distributions, we're going to try to multiply quantum states. Uh, so I have, you know, this is the same pictures, but now instead of thinking of these as distributions, I'm going to think of these as um, the the amplitudes of some quantum state, right? Uh, but it's the same problem. So I have I have some quantum state that has amplitudes in this picture. You know, it's uh, positive amplitudes on the comb, zero everywhere else. Um, and this one, it's you know some Gaussian weighted uh, superposition. And I want to compute the product state where the, the amplitudes on every point are the pointwise products of the amplitudes of the original state. And again, there's an issue of normalization here. Um, but that, that's, that's going to be the goal. And note that uh, having a quantum state, uh, you can always measure the state and get a sample from some distribution uh, where the outputs are proportional to the squared amplitude. So Basically, what we're hoping for here is some sort of, uh, I have stronger inputs rather than getting a sampler, I'm actually given a quantum state, which implies a sampler, and I want to somehow multiply these together to get a, a quantum state for the product state, which, again, which then implies a sampler for the product distribution. So stronger inputs, stronger outputs. Uh, but, but nevertheless, there's still maybe no reason to think this is possible. Uh, you know, it looks, it looks superficially at least very similar to the classical case of distributions. You have these two quantum states. How do you make use of uh, generators for these two quantum states 
to make some single state. You know, the the algorithm. You have two algorithms that produce these each of these quantum states. How do you how do you combine them in a meaningful way? Um, and just like the classical case, it's going to be undefined or impossible if the supports are disjoint. And also in full generality, this would imply an efficient algorithm for NP. So again, we don't we don't expect to be able to do this in full generality. Um, and it's maybe a priori unclear how we could do this in a special case, in, in even special cases. Uh, but the, the point of, of this talk is to show that actually there are some cases where we can do this in a meaningful way. And um, this leads to interesting results. So what we're going to do is let's just look at the Fourier domain. So we're going to look at the Fourier domain for our two input states and also the Fourier domain for the output state. This is a very natural thing to do. Uh, quantum Fourier transforms are one of the core building blocks of many or most of the quantum algorithms we know. And so we might as well apply the quantum Fourier transform to everything and see what happens. So when I take the Fourier transform of my input states, I get new states with different amplitudes uh, here denoted by these alpha hat um, and beta hats. And what is the output state of, of, the, of the product state? So what does the product state look like in the Fourier domain? Uh, well, it turns out that we actually know exactly what this looks like in terms of the Fourier domain um, versions of the input states. And this is the convolution theorem. And it says that the Fourier transform of the product is the convolution of the Fourier transforms of the inputs. And here in the ket notation, the convolution has this nice form. It's the sum over all x and y, where x ranges over the domain of the one state, y ranges over the domain of the other state. Uh, we get an x plus y term. And the coefficient or the amplitude on x plus y is alpha hat beta y, uh, alpha x hat beta y hat. All right. So if we can, what this shows is that if we can convolve the two states, then we can actually multiply them, right? You just, uh, well, here, I have the outline here. So if, if you want to multiply two, two states, the first thing you do is you just construct each one of them. We're, we're assuming the ability to do this. Uh, we switch to the Fourier domain by performing the quantum Fourier transform. And if we just put these two states next to each other and look at their uh, look at the joint system, what we get is something that looks almost like what we're aiming for. It's uh, you know sum over x y alpha hat x beta hat y, uh, but instead of x plus y here we have x comma y. So that's that's. You know, that's the only thing that's keeping us from uh, achieving our goal. Um, so now what we do is we just add them in superposition. This is a basic operation we can easily do uh, as long as we make sure it's unitary and that's important. So we just simply have the classical map that maps x comma y to x comma y comma x plus y. And we apply this in superposition. So we can we can apply this map here. And now we have this state that has an x, a y, and an x plus y. So we got the x plus y that we wanted all along, um, but we're not quite done, right? We, we need to somehow get rid of the x comma y. If we could get rid of the x comma y, we're left with x plus y, and we can Fourier transform back and actually get the product state that we desired. Um, so what we need is some coding procedure that takes x plus y and actually computes x and y. Or it's really enough to just compute, say, x, right? Because if you have x plus y and x, you can recover y just by subtraction. Right, so this is, this is going to be the, uh, our, our blueprint. So construct the state separately, uh, move to Fourier domain, add in superposition, and then there's this last decoding step to uncompute uh, th th these leftover x and y terms. And you know, uh, just to reiterate, we're given that we can construct these separately. So we're, we're, we're given step one. Step two, step two is, is easy. And uh, step three is where all the difficulties lie. Um, and, and in fact, because we know that we don't expect to be able to 
um, construct the product state in general, we don't expect this decoding process to be possible in general. Um, and, and in fact, you know, it's easy to come up with examples where, where the decoding, where, you know, you know, think about it, X, X plus Y uh, came from, you know, whatever the domain of the states are, there's, there's, but somehow we have to decode X comma Y. There's a lot more information in X comma Y than X plus Y, twice as, twice as many uh, qubits in X comma Y as X plus Y. Um, so we're only going to be able to decode in very special situations where, um, you know, X and Y sort of are, are, are very constrained so that X plus Y uniquely determines both X and Y. All right, and ju just to reiterate, to see, see what it might look like when, when things, when you, when you can multiply and when you cannot, we can consider uh, the case that I had pictured before where I had my, my, um, my comb and I had a, you know, some narrow Gaussian here. And here, what happens when I convolve is basically I just get a bunch of copies of the Gaussian shifted according to the spikes in the comb. And in and in this picture, the spikes are pretty far apart. And so my 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 Gaussians that I get and my Gaussian comb are are pretty far apart, and they'll have they'll have negligible overlap, basically zero overlap. And so if you were to give me a point on here. On, on uh, anywhere in the product state, if you were to give me a point, I could actually uniquely determine the X and Y it came from, right? The basically which hump it came from tells me which spike in the comb and where in the hump relative to the center of the hump told, tells me where I came from in the, in the Gaussian. So in, in this case, actually the coding is possible at least up to some, some negligible error because there will be some you know, tiny bleed over between the tails of the Gaussian. Um, but what happens if the, you know, instead of uh, you know, a nice comb on the left here, I actually had uh, maybe uh, you know, something a bit smoother like this. Well, now when I convolve with the Gaussian, um, I'm still gonna get something that has all, all these peaks uh, but now the tails of the Gaussian really are bleeding together quite significantly. And if you were to give me a point on, on one of these humps, you know, you don't know if that point, you know, that's, this is X plus Y on, on, on one hump over here on, on the right. You don't know if that, uh, you don't know how to uniquely decode that as X plus Y. It could have been that it came from, you know, one hump over here, or it could have been the adjacent hump. Uh, we just, there's no way to know. And so there's no way to uniquely decode. Okay. Um, okay. So with that in mind, um, I I want to say where where's where the algorithm was this uh, algorithm was used uh, first, at least as far as I know, um, and this was uh, due to a, a famous result of of Regev. Um, and so in his case, he was looking at a at a very special case of, of this multiplying quantum states. Um, where, what are the two input states? So, so the one state is the indicator function for some linear code C, or think of it as just a, you know, a sequence of linear equations over a finite field. Um, and the other state is a, what's called a discrete Gaussian. So a multivariate discrete Gaussian. So it's like a Gaussian, except it only has, um, you know, amplitude on, on integers. And if you take the product state, what you get, uh, because this Gaussian here only has short integer vectors in its support, the product state are short integer vectors satisfying a system of linear equations, you know, belonging to the linear code. Um, so the product state is a superposition over short vectors in C. And if you measure that state, you get, you know, a random short vector in, in the code. And, um, Solving this problem is, is what's known as a short integer solution problem, or CIS, right? So th this, is, this is a famous hard problem um, in computer science and, and also specifically in cryptography. Given a system of random linear equations, find, find a short vector. Um, and so that, that, that was uh, Regev's goal in considering uh, this. And uh, when you switch to the Fourier domain, what you get, well, the Fourier transform of the of these alpha x's is actually just another indicator function, but this time for the dual code. Um, 
or, or you know thinking of it as linear algebra to the the dual space of the um, linear equation. And the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian uh, with a with a different width. And now when you convolve these, what you get is something that looks like a multi-dimensional version of the of the picture that I had pictured for our example. Uh, right. So the indicator function for for linear subspace is kind of like the is a multi-dimensional version of the comb. And then you have the, you know, this this Gaussian here. And what this ends up being is you get you get uh, a state where the where you have a bunch of Gaussian balls centered at the the um, the dual code points, and this is known as bounded distance decoding, uh, perhaps more famously known as learning with errors. Um, and basically, um, you know, Rega was trying to solve this and realized that he could solve it if he could um, you know solve this learning with errors problem, uh, but you know, it turns out that, uh, you know, maybe now we believe that actually both are hard. Um, and you, so you can turn this on his head and say, well, uh, because we don't, you know, if, if you were to believe that cis is hard, that there, there is no quantum algorithm for cis, well, that actually implies a quantum algorithm for the hardness of learning with errors. So, so where, where Regev you know, failed to actually complete the algorithm because he, he was unable to come up with an algorithm for this learning with errors problem. Uh, this this approach actually, you could turn it on its head and use it as a hardness justification to convince yourself that learning with errors is actually is actually hard. Uh, you know, assuming the hardness of the Schrodinger solution problem, which is you know a, a famous problem with connections to uh, hard problems on lattices and and widely believed um, to be hard. OK, so, so this was Rega's first example, sort of a, a, a failure uh, to, to instantiate this multiplying quantum states algorithm, but actually turn into a very useful proof of hardness for learning with errors. And uh, you know, now I'll finally get to, to our setting, where we actually give a positive application of quantum state multiplication. Um, and our, our problem is going to look a little bit similar. We're also going to have a, a linear code be our, our alpha x, our first input state. Um, but then what we're going to do is we're going to restrict it in a different way. Instead of restricting it to um, you know, short integer solutions uh, to the code, we're going to restrict it a little differently. And what we're going to do is we're going to go coordinate by coordinate and uh, just you know, arbitrarily throw away a half of the coordinates and say, you know, you're only a valid solution if your coordinate is, you know, is in the subset of size, you know, roughly half of the of, of all the x coordinates. And we'll do this by querying some hash function h. So this hash function will output a single bit and will tell us whether the x coordinate is in the is allowed or not. Um, and then we, you know, so we'll do this for x coordinates, then we'll we'll randomly throw away half of the valid y coordinates, half of the valid z coordinates, and so forth. And, and eventually get, um, you know, we, we've thrown away roughly half of every single coordinate. And now your goal is to come up with a set of valid coordinates that also happens to satisfy the linear constraints of the code. All right, so, so that's our problem. And what we are going to do now is try to multiply quantum states in order to solve it. And we'll see that in our case, we actually can, can do this. Um, so, so our two input states are as follows. Our first input state is again the indicator function for a linear code, just like in Rega. Um, our beta x are going to be what's different. There, there's no Gaussians here. Instead, our our beta x are going to be the indicator function for for valid coordinates, or, or really tuples of valid coordinates, um, right? And then the the product will be you know, solutions to the linear equations for the code that happen to all have valid coordinates, which will be, which will exactly be solutions to our, our problem that we defined. Um, okay, so uh, I guess the first thing to remark is that, you know, both the alpha x state and the beta x state, we, we can efficiently construct, these are easy. The alpha x, this is just linear algebra and the, the beta x, these indicator functions, you can easily do also, um, with just some simple uh, rejection sampling. 
Um, and so what really remains in order to, to get um, an algorithm for this problem is to solve the decoding problem. So, so what is the decoding problem? Uh, well, let, let's think about it. Remember, it's a convolution of the Fourier transforms of the two input states. So the one input state, uh, just like in regex, was the dual code of whatever code we're using. Um, so it's just a um, yeah, set, set of, uh, a set of points. Um, and then for the valid coordinate part, this is going to depend on, on what hash function you use. Uh, we, we will assume a random hash function. So, so basically, the, for each coordinate, we'll assume that the hash function for that coordinate just hashes every uh, input down to a random bit. Uh, and we'll, we'll you know, heuristically treat it as a, as a uniform random bit for every single coordinate. Right, so our, our, if we zoom into just a single coordinate, our, our state just looks like, it looks like a mess. It's just this sort of randomly oscillating between zero and one, that's normalization. Um, but this random mess, actually has a really nice form in the Fourier domain uh, because you know the the integral under this random mess is roughly a half because we're, you know half the time we're at one half the time at zero. What this means is in the Fourier domain, uh, our Fourier coefficient at zero has amplitude roughly a half. And everywhere else, all the other Fourier coefficients uh, go away. They, they, right, the, the randomness here sort of end, ends up causing the other Fourier coefficients to be negligible. Um, so, so actually we have a, you know, there, there's a complex phase in, in all these Fourier coefficients that encodes all the randomness in our, our state. Uh, but if you just look at the amplitudes, the, the Fourier domain is this very nice form. Right, so, so our, our product state then in the Fourier domain, remember it's a superposition over X plus Y. X is a random dual code word. Uh, and Y uh, is, is this thing that in every coordinate has amplitude a half on zero and is otherwise you know, is sort of uniformly spread out across the domain. Uh, so, so Y is going to be this sort of noise term that uh, is zero in half of the coordinates, roughly half the coordinates, and, and has random errors in the other half the coordinates. So I have a dual code word plus random errors in half the coordinates. And it turns out that this is actually a decoding from X plus Y, recovering X and Y from this is actually a well-known problem. This is just uh, sort of the usual setting of error correcting codes, right? In, in, uh, except we're just correcting for this, this dual code word. Uh, instead of the original code word, right? So that that you know, this is exactly what we're doing in error correction, where you you take your your code and you sort of scramble some fraction of the coordinates and make them something else. Now, in the regime that we care about, where you have errors in half the coordinates, you can't use unique uh, decoding in the in the traditional sense, uh, but but you can use list decoding. Um, and use the fact that the errors are random to guarantee that you succeed in decoding. Uh, and so what we show is that if you're if you actually do model your hash function as a as a random function, uh, then you can actually you can actually decode efficiently and from x plus y recover x and y separately with high probability, assuming the the dual code um, is list decodable for a half plus epsilon fraction of errors. Uh, and we and we know how to construct these um, these list decodable codes. This is well known. Um, and and that that's uh, that's more or less it. That's our that's our algorithm. Um, there, there's there's um, why do we care about this contrived problem? I'll just briefly say that we 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 show that this problem is actually. Um, or, or we give evidence anyway that this problem is actually hard for classical computers. This requires more properties on the code um, and sort of, um, you know, a, a conjecture that our, our, you know, random hash function heuristic is, is valid, uh, but, but it's, you know, some, some pretty convincing evidence, I think. 
Um, and this, uh, what's interesting is it's the first super polynomial advantage for NP that doesn't rely on, on period finding. Um, and it's also the first example of super polynomial advantage that doesn't re uh, rely on tools from public key cryptography, just, just hash functions. Um, no, no public key crypto systems. Um, and I guess I'll just, you know, so this is the, the end of the talk and I'll just leave it with sort of this interesting open question of the, we now have this, we have this technique of multiplying quantum states that's been used, you know, both for, you know, negative results showing hardness of problems and also for positive results, um, you know, that we use for quantum advantage. And it seems really like there's probably a lot more here um, than, this, than just these two isolated examples. What else can this technique be used for? Is there, you know, any, anything exciting that can be done? Um, and that, that's it for my talk.